Um, <clears throat> oh, okay. Uh, my talk today is going to be a little bit different. Uh, I'm going to actually concentrate on one small element, relatively small element, of my uh, recent work with, with diadema antelarum. Um, the title of my talk is Diadema Antelarum Culture, a New Marine Larvae Rearing Technology. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, gee, He's pretty ballsy getting up there and, and talking about a new technology. And ballsy isn't even a word, is it? Uh, and actually it is. Ballsy means aggressively bold, gutsy, nervy. Uh, the synonyms are bold, brave, confident, courageous, daring, gallant, gutsy, having nerves of steel, heroic, undaunted, valiant, and fearless. And yeah, I'm, I'm gutsy. But actually, I'm, I'm not nearly as gutsy as uh, most of the people at this convention. Uh, there are, the people at, the, in, at this convention are the ones that have taken the marine aquarium hobby from uh, a glass box with a slate bottom to what it is today, it, a vibrant, extremely uh, scientific, vital, uh, an important part of ocean research throughout the globe. I, I mean, you, you've been able to uh, uh, take a coral reef and put it in a glass box in a living room. That was impossible not too long ago. I've, if you attended Tal's talk, uh, he talked about some of the early things we did, and you know we were stumbling around in the dark. Tom Frakes and Frank Hoff and I and Chris Turk and, and uh, uh, the people that worked with us. And now you can do the impossible in your garage, or at least what was considered impossible back then. So uh, actually, I'm barely ballsy compared to uh, so many people here that are really ballsy. Uh, that, that when you can take uh, and take the challenge of starting a marine aquarium and going from that to creating a reef tank and creating a culture system, that's, that's ballsy. Um, now, on new technology, uh, you'll have to make up your own mind on this, but uh, the encyclopedia says that uh, new technology is any set of productive techniques which offers a significant improvement, whether measured, I don't have to use that thing, measured in terms of increased output or savings in costs over the established technology for, of a, for a given process in a specific historical context. In other words, pretty much everything that you all have been doing over the past 40 years to create the new uh, technology for marine aquariums is the development of new technology. So by the end of uh, my talk, I'll let you decide on your own whether or not what I've done is a new technology. So why diadema? Why did I spend 15 years of my life, and there's not that much of it left, uh, working on developing a technique for spawning and rearing diadema antelarum? Well, diadema antelarum, a sea urchin, is the sea urchin of the tropical reefs of the Atlantic. It is the keystone herbivore. It is the species that creates the ecology of, of where a coral reef can, can flourish. On the uh, left, you see a coral reef back in 1980. That's a picture I took of a French angel. And then when I started working on uh, diadema, I looked in there and I could see, one, a nice, clear, uh, algae-free, strong, hard sediment-based reef with a French angel and with all of these 
there's seven or eight of them in that picture. I wasn't taking a picture of uh, uh, diadema, but there they are. And on the right, you see a picture of a Florida reef that I took in 2003. And there's a tremendous difference there. And one of the major reasons for that difference is that there is no longer, as of 1983, effective herbivory on our coral reefs. Uh, and the reason for that is that in 1983, all of the diadema antelarum, almost all of them, all but about one and a half or two percent, died in a tremendous uh, plague that swept through the Caribbean, the Bahamas, Florida, and killed 98 percent of the diadema. And they have not come back. There's a whole batch of reasons for that. But I don't want to uh, get into that because that would take a long time. So that's why I started working on diadema, was the idea to be able to uh, culture them, to spawn and rear them and use them, used as they do with the corals now. My friend Ken Niedermeyer and I worked on this uh, uh, back in 2001. And now I'm not going to get into that because it takes too much time. But anyway, the, the diadema are essential to developing the ecology that drives the ecosystem of our coral reefs. And I wanted to be able to do that. And I did. Uh, I just developed a, a laboratory of my own in my house and a, uh, a room that was down there. Uh, closer to the beach, and I developed a, a little laboratory that I could run myself, that I could use my, that I could run all by myself. It contained uh, 30 culture tanks, 8 to, uh, to 150 gallons, a uh, microalgae culture facility, a microscope lab, a food preparation pr uh, process, urchin spawning, and genetic engineering. And the reason I did genetic engineering was because I wanted to show that, yeah, we can really, we can really do great things. And so I thought, well, I'll just do a, a quick genetic engineering project just to uh, get that established and then establish our, our, uh, our laboratory there. And I thought, well, what would be the best organism to start with on that? It would have to be something spectacular, something that really needed uh, to improvement. And I thought, you know, the manatee is kind of a, a slow, dim-witted uh, animal and it gets hit by boats. And maybe if we could improve its intelligence, we could really uh, make it work. And I haven't seen any of these around down there, so they, they must be working. Now, the spawning procedure for diadema is, is very simple. You uh, put the adults in a broodstock system. You maintain at 26 degrees centigrade, 35 parts per thousand, 13 hours of photo period, and you feed them as much as, 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 they, as they can eat. Then after a month or two, when they're conditioned, you take and put them in warm water, uh, into a, ba a bath, a warm water tray at about 30 degrees centigrade. And, uh, Typically, at, when you do that, the males spawn first. And then following them, the females will spawn. And if they don't quite, if they don't do it, usually the males always go. Maybe there's a message in that. But the, the females uh, often will go, but sometimes they don't. And then if they don't, you just wait a couple of weeks and try again, and then they go. And that's so much better than the old method of turning them over and injecting them with potassium chloride and causing the gonads to go I could do that again if you want. And they just squeeze the eggs out. And uh, that's not good for them. You lose about 10% uh, of, the, of the brood stock and you also, the, not that many eggs are uh, viable and, and strong. So spawning turned out to be a little bit of a problem to work out, but we got that worked out. Now, the larvae for diadema and for other urchins as well, but diadema have an extremely delicate, chemically sensitive, biologically complex, and long-lived larvae. Um, 
The larval period may be as short as 30 days or extend for over 55 days. And the larval morphology, which give you a clue into, into uh, how, uh, how much these larvae are dependent upon the physical environment in which they grow, uh, they they can vary greatly just with the turbulence in the water. You know, if you put them in high turbulence, uh, um, a small tank with a big air stone going, uh, what happens is that, let's see now. Well, anyway, on, on the left is a, a shot of larvae raised in high turbulence, and the arms uh, the diadema of sea urchins have these long arms that they develop, and these long arms help them navigate in the water. There's cilia on all of these arms that beat backwards, so they're, they are going what we would call backwards, but they don't care what it is. And uh, that gives them some navigation, some uh, ability to navigate and move themselves around. Uh, and under controlled turbulence, the arms grow much larger, the central uh, photo there. And in very low turbulence, the arms extend tremendously. They'll go out over a centimeter in length when they grow. So the larvae are difficult to grow. And the one reason why they are so difficult to culture, well, uh, urchin, sea urchin embryos, uh, and the development of, of the first three or four days of the uh, embryo in the egg of the, of the sea urchin is the basis for the science of embryology because both vertebrate and uh, echinoderms have radial uh, cleavage. And so you can uh, map out the whole uh, story of embryology that applies to vertebrates with the sea urchin but you can't raise them. They could not be raised until 19, the early 1970s. And the reason for that is that they are not only very delicate and very long-lived, but they are negatively buoyant. Uh, excuse me. They are negatively, yeah, they're negatively buoyant. They go down, they sink. And uh, they, you have to be able to keep them uh, in keep them in suspension in order for them to live. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run through fairly quickly the life cycle of the larval period of the diadema so you get an idea of what they look like and what I'm talking about. Um, I don't think I've got a... Do I have a, a little laser? Okay. Uh, I don't. I won't need that. I do, but I'm going to ignore it. Uh, the, you here. You have the eggs. You have day three, the, the the prism development, where they start begin feeding on day three. Day five, they're feeding pretty well. They're growing. Day nine, the arms are are thickening and uh, beginning to grow longer. On uh, day thirteen, the arms are gaining in in girth. Day nineteen, arms are elongating. Day 17, you're beginning to get the rudiment development, the very early rudiment development. And you see up here in the upper, upper left photo, there's a little red circle. And within that red circle, if you look really close, you'll see five little circles. And that is the very beginning of the rudiment. And uh, the rudiment is the very beginnings of the juvenile sea urchin. Uh, sea urchins have a larval development that is as complex as uh, the caterpillar from a butterfly. That little, earth, that little rudiment will grow and develop uh, into the juvenile sea urchin. The, the larvae never actually becomes uh, a larvae. Uh, the larvae never actually becomes a juvenile. The juvenile grows within the body of the larvae. It is the larvae's uh, job to take care of the developing rudiment, carry it through the plankton for up to, up to 60 days, typically in culture 42 days, and then find a settlement place for it. And then the, uh, 
the juvenile takes over, it fastens itself with one of these tube feet to the bottom, and the, the tissues of the larvae flow down into the developing juvenile, and within a few hours, you have a juvenile, uh, juvenile diadema uh, sea urchin. And it, when it comes through all of that, it is about a millimeter in size, very small. Um, so on day 25, you can see the first extended uh, external tube foot. Day 36, it's, it's pretty large. Some of them are close to uh, settlement. And on, on day 36, you see the, the rudiment is actually extruding itself from the body of the larvae. The tube feet are out there, and it's searching for a place to settle. Uh, on day 30, the larvae is close to settling. And you'll even see a little pedicillaria that's growing off the back of the diadema. And that doesn't typically happen with diadema. It happens with Trypneustes, another species of uh, tropical sea urchin, but not so much with, with diadema. But there you see the rudiment that is growing out. And then what happens, it settles. And the two plates on the upper right are the, uh, the settlement plates that I put into the culture vessel. And uh, from the rearing run of April 2010, now you, that is a close-up of that particular settlement plate there. And if you look real close, you can see all of these little dots that are within the, uh, the, within the squares of the light crate uh, material there. And those are all newly settled and metamorphosed juvenile diadema, thousands of them on that plate. Uh, because you can, you can raise 50,000 of them in that larval, uh, in the culture vessel. Now here, this is, metam this is the, uh, the larvae as it settles, and you can see it's walking around on its tube feet. And here, the settled larvae is in mid-metamorphosis, and the uh, arms are becoming smaller and all of the tissues are coming down into the body of the, the transforming body of the juvenile. Day 44 is the early juvenile. Day 52 is five days post settlement and it's beginning to feed. And it has to carry with it when it goes through metamorphosis. It can't, it, it changes from a benthic, uh, from a, a, a pelagic feeding larvae that feeds upon microalgae to a benthic feeding juvenile that feeds upon uh, coated diatoms and algae and, and bacteria on a, on a substrate. And it can't do that immediately. It has to carry with it the nutrients uh, from the larval period that will provide the food for it to grow all of its hard parts, the hard test, uh, and the gut, and the Aristotle's lantern, the feeding mechanism, and that takes four or five days. Uh, and these are the juveniles that we grew. Uh, day 99, day 124, day 102, and you can just, they just grow and grow and, and uh, uh, become adults in about, oh, a year, basically. And these are juveniles on uh, crustose coral and algae in a shallow settlement tray. And over the years that we, we worked with them, uh, we went through three generations of diadema. We spawned them, grew them up, spawned them, grew them up, spawned them, and grew them up. So the culture process does not affect the vitality and the ability to, uh, to reproduce of the, uh, of the adults that come from that work. Now, the requirements for diadema larva culture uh, there's six basic requirements. I'll tell you what they are, and then I'm only going to talk about one. I don't have time to do the others. Uh, the first and the one I'm going to talk about is the creation of a culture vessel that provides a slow, stable, and continuous water current. Two, provides systems for water change and vessel cleaning. And you'll see that that's kind of tricky. Three, provide a, for a large volume water exchange without disruption of the vessel operation. 
Four, development of a cleaning system for the culture vessel. Five, provide for larval food, which is microalgae. Six, provide for large-scale settlement, metamorphosis, and early juvenile development. Now, I'm only going to talk about the culture vessel uh, because that was the big, the big holdup all the way through the last 150 years of sea urchin uh, culture work. In 19... Uh, 70, in the early 1970s, R. R. Strathman uh, developed an apparatus that would, that would take the volume of water that the larvae was in and stir it very slowly with a paddle that was attached to a low RPM motor and a device that would move it back and forth. And that stirred the water just enough to keep the larvae up above the... Uh, Above, above the bottom, above the substrate, and make it a pelagic organism so that it could feed and grow. And he was able to grow uh, urchins on that, with that apparatus. And from the 70s uh, on, that was the only way you could raise uh, urchin larvae through this uh, larval process. Without that, they'd sink to the bottom and die, or they would be so turbulent that they couldn't grow well and they would die. So uh, that was in, uh, <clears throat> in about, I don't have that one there, 1998. Oh, no, no, this, this, was, this was earlier. This was about in the early 1970s. Uh, they did a study, R.R. Uh, R. Strathman, in the early 70s, uh, developed it, and then Roy Walcott at Nova, Nova University used that particular apparatus, that was his photo, uh, of the system that he used to raise Tripneustes. Then in 1998, Tom Capo did a different thing at the University of Miami. He had this beautiful cabinet set up. He had roller bottles inside this cabinet that was lighted and temperature controlled. And the roller bottles, they were sitting on two rollers that rolled uh, like that. And it rolled the bottle around at a very slow rate. And that kept the larvae in suspension because the bottle was rolling. And he was able to, to rear uh, uh, hundreds a few hundred, uh, and uh, that was an advancement. That was a new technology. Uh, and then I came along, and I, was, I worked out, and I developed a culture vessel where I could raise 100,000 of them in 50 liters. Uh, and then in 2009, Dave Vaughn created, a, at the Moat Marine Laboratory, created a 15 hundred gallon uh, culture vessel that was able to raise millions of them. Uh, and that is basically where it, where it stayed. Now this is the culture vessel that I developed. And man, I had a tough time doing that. That, that was to try to, you, you, had to, you had to give the larvae the right turbulence that they needed to stay in, uh, to stay in suspension. And not only did you have to be able to keep them in suspension when they were an egg that was 70 microns or, or a blastula that was 70 microns across, but you also had to be able to adjust that turbulence so that you could increase the turbulence significantly but not too much uh, over the whole 42, 45 day life of that larvae. And because what you needed in turbulence at 42 days uh, was too much for the early, it had to be adjustable. And I was able to, to and you also, you could, not, you could not use any kind of filtration in there because anything that you used to filter it, these larvae were so enable, unable to control their swimming that they would just plaster up against it. And they would, they would just, you would just clear them all out no matter what kind of filtration you used. So you, you couldn't use a pump in there. You couldn't put them through a pump. You couldn't uh, put a, a, a filtration in there. You couldn't use a pump. You had to use aeration. But you had to be able to control that aeration. And the 
the type of vessel that I made was a half creosote, uh, 50, 50 liter half creosote. But it wasn't a true creosote because one side of it was flat. And at the bottom of that side, I attached a, a wand, an aeration wand. And the aeration wand came up, it, it blew a, a curtain of bubbles up that flat side. I tried, I tried a real creosote with the, the wand in the middle, and you wound up with two uh, gyres like this, which moved too fast and didn't work. But by making a flat side and putting the arm up against the side of it, you, it came up and you, it created a slower gyre that went all the way around that way. But if that was all there was to it, it, it wouldn't work because it, the turbulence would get so great that it would just discombobulate everything. And I was trying to figure out, now how uh, can I control that aeration pulse? And I happened to run into Julian Sprung at a, uh, a meeting of the uh, Florida Aquarium S Society there. And I was talking with him about that. And he said, you know, why don't you use a repeat relay timer? And I, I, I have one, you can, you can borrow it. So we use it for creating different wave patterns in reef tanks. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, it, it worked beautifully. I was able to hook the air pump up to that repeat relay timer and set it for four seconds on and 35 seconds off. And that would give me a, 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 a very good, I'll show you, now, maybe that'll work, yeah. This is, this is the system in operation. And you can see in it, I've got little bits of paper and little bits of fabric and string and whatnot. And now the pulse comes on and it pushes up. And uh, that gives it, actually I had to use a lot more pulse on this than I would for the larvae because these things are much heavier than the larvae. But you can see how it, moves them around and it gives you, uh, it gives them whatever control you want. And you can control it. You can control the water movement by the length of time that the air is on, by the size of the air bubbles, by the intensity of the aeration, by the time that it's off, by the placement of the air wand on the side of the tank. You have a lot of control over the creation of that turbulence. And so you can, uh, you set it for the requirements of the different life stages of the larvae that you're working with, or for many different kinds of larvae as well. Um, now, this was how we built it. Uh, what I built it, uh, no, you know, I couldn't order it built. Nobody knew what I wanted. And so we built it ourselves. Uh, what you need is I, I built a, um, a frame of metal, uh, uh, a metal roofing strip, and I got it set up as best I could, and then I laid the uh, acrylic over it, and you have to have a wife to hold it kind of together, and I used two air guns and melted it down, and then the result of it was the, uh, uh, the creosote that you see, or the, or the culture vessel, as I like to call it, on, on the right there. Now, oh, now I'm going again. Okay, but it's neat. I like to watch it go. It takes about a minute and a half, and, it, and you can, not even that, through a half a minute, I guess, and you can control, control it, the whole water movement situation so perfectly with it. And that was what enabled me to maintain the larvae for... 40 days, 60 days, 90 days if you need it. And this is a schematic that shows the setup completely. On the, on the left is the culture vessel, uh, just the, is, is the culture vessel itself, and you can see how it, how it works and how it's set up, and those red strips are the, the braces that uh, keep it together. And then on the right is the whole system. And what I did after a while, I put a, at the top of the, of the air side of the 
the flat side of the culture vessel, I put a little window in there that was about, oh, uh, three quarters of an inch wide and about eight inches long. And I covered that with 105 micron uh, mesh, nylon mesh, and uh, made a little cup underneath it with a drain. And on top, I made some reservoirs that were the same volume, 50 liters, as the volume of the culture vessels, and uh, with an air valve to control it. So I could open that air valve on the bottom and get a flush through the through the um, culture vessel and with the drainage on the outside of that cup, it would go through and the water, the air coming up, kept them off of that screen that was up there. So I could change water that way as much as I wanted, as often as I wanted. If I opened it all the way so I get a stream, I would change it in, change the water and, or do a 50, actually do a 100% change. So that wound up in a 50% static uh, uh, change. And that would, I could do that twice a day if I wanted. I, usually I did it once a day at night. And that gave me a, a, a capability of changing the water in that culture vessel without messing with the larvae at all. And I could just add the micro, micro algae to it that I needed it, that I needed to keep it, to keep it going during that time. Uh, and uh, that was very versatile. I figured out how you could do it, and the Florida Aquarium is, was working, working on this, and I think they've got that set up pretty well, where you could have a closed system that would do this. And I'll go, I won't go through the whole thing because it's kind of tricky, but if you, if you want a copy of it, I'll be happy to give it to you. Uh, but th this way you could have a, a bank of these culture vessels and you can have a filtration system that will take care of the water without any interference with the, with the life uh, of the larvae at all and then bring it back in. And then using the sump of the system, you can change water in the whole system as much as you want, as much as you need. So I, didn't, I haven't done this myself yet, but... I'm reasonably sure it'll work. Now this is uh, the Tripneustes, um, <clears throat> Tripneustes ventricosa, which is the Indian sea egg, they call it. It, it was the basis for a, a major commercial fishery in Barbados and uh, uh, other uh, Caribbean islands. But because of changes in water quality and because of uh, over, uh, over harvesting them, it's, it's not hard to catch a sea urchin. You know, all you got to do is see it and pick it up and put it in the bag. And these urchins, I didn't put a picture in there, but, but they, they have short little spines and you can handle them easily. But the commercial fishery for them is gone now because the, the basis for the fishery is gone. But you, you could, using this technology, redevelop that fishery completely, either as a totally aquacultured system or as a uh, restoration system. They grow on uh, uh, grass beds. They don't grow on the reefs. Uh, and that's uh, a day, at day 61, a little... the. Uh, ledge that he's sitting on there is the edge of a piece of quarter inch acrylic. So that will give you an idea to the size of it. And the, the uh, larvae is so tremendously different from the diadema larvae. And they were easy to do, no problem. Uh, thousands of them came through the same, with the same, same systems where the diadema didn't thrive. Uh, and the reason the diadema didn't thrive was, it, oh, I, I can't, if I get into that, you'll be here another hour. He, uh, they were incredibly sensitive to nickel. They were, uh, a, a nickel concentration at 15 parts per billion would wipe them out. And okay, don't use nickel. However, nickel is a significant component of stainless steel. That's what makes steel stainless. And uh, uh, 
just the exposure to the stainless steel that was in a reverse osmosis system or just a couple of, of screw heads exposed to it, it just wiped them out. And copper, copper is just as bad, if not worse. So a system for growing sea urchins, but in particular the diadema, have to be devoid of any metals. Otherwise, it wipes, it wipes them out. Uh, but the trypneustes are not quite that sensitive. So I, there was no problem. They, they could come through tremendously. And I think that this particular methodology for larval culture has uh, possibilities not only for sea urchins, but for other organisms as well. I got some uh, coral larvae, Acropora cervicornis from Ken Niedemeyer a couple of years ago, and uh, just to see how they would do in this kind of a culture vessel system. And they, they did great. They, I was under the impression at that time that it would take a couple of weeks for them to go through the larval stage. And at the end of uh, three days, they were all gone. And I wondered, you know, what happened? They'd all settled out. And they're really neat because as, as you look at the posterior, they have a posterior and an anterior, even though they are globular. But on the posterior end, they have large cilia. You can see them actually in this photo on both, this, uh, both of these larvae. The one on the top has a little orange stripe around it, and those are the enlarged cilia that drive them. And you can see the cilia, the, actually the, the uh, separate stalks of the flagellum of the, of the, uh, uh, that are the cilia uh, on, around the posterior end of that, and, of that larvae, and that's, they, it drives them around. They can, you see this little balloon going all, all around. So I think there's a possibility where you can use this kind of uh, a system uh, for other, other types of marine larvae, because this slow gyre technology uh, can give you such tremendous control over not only the physical uh, structure of the water in the system, but also control over what goes into the system, how much goes into it, uh, what you put into it, and how it um, uh, and how the water exchanges can can go. It various echinoderms, shrimp, mycid, shrimp, crustaceans, various. Uh, invertebrates, jellyfish, uh, and with some modifications, possibly some delicate fish larvae, although fish larvae have a much greater capacity for uh, individual movement. And, or maybe not, but that research needs to be done. If, if you want to try that, uh, you, can, you can make one and, and do it yourself. And that is the end of my presentation.